How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Johnny here again, this time taking a look at 19.5 stuff. Gibbs free energy. So our objectives are explain the significance of Gibbs free energy and what values are associated with spontaneous reactions, non-spontaneous reactions, and reactions that are at equilibrium. So that's our goal, right? We also want to be able to calculate the change in Gibbs free energy using known values at standard conditions. And there's the equation. This is stuff that you've done at least two other times. So I'm hoping that second part is easy for you. All right, cool. So what we already know, well, we know spontaneity depends on two factors, entropy and enthalpy, so disorder and the heat. Uh, nature favors lower energy, so exothermic reactions are favored because our uh, products end up with less energy, and that's favored. Uh, nature also favors higher entropy, more randomness. We want stuff to end up messier than they used to be, so that's favored uh, by nature. There are spontaneous reactions that are endothermic, so remember the example of the ice packs the uh, and the first aid kids that you crack them and then they get cold that's a spontaneous reaction that's endothermic endothermic isn't favored by nature so why is that happening um because they increase entropy that's why they happen right so every spontaneous reaction that's endothermic increases the entropy there are also spontaneous reactions that decrease the entropy think about uh, in the previous examples where we talk about rusting so things become less chaotic, uh, but they're still spontaneous. How is that possible? Well, they're all exothermic. So we know that these two factors play a role. So how can we use these factors, the change in heat, delta H, and change in entropy, delta S, to predict the spontaneity of reactions? we got a reaction. Is it going to be spontaneous? I don't know how we figure that out. Oh, here, warning. There's going to be math following here, this next slide. It's going to explain the derivation of an important equation that we're going to use. You don't really need to know this whole process with how we got the equation, but it, you know, some people find it really helpful to understand where these equations came from. If you're not one of those people and you just want to say, hey, shut up, tell me the equation I need to know, uh, skip to the next part of this, you know, the next slide. All right. Okay. So what we know, assuming we got constant temperature and pressure, we know that the change in entropy of the universe has to equal the change in entropy of the system and the change in entropy of the surroundings. We know for spontaneous reactions, the delta S is greater than zero. The universe is becoming more chaotic, right? For spontaneous reactions, it's greater than zero. We also know that the delta S, the change in entropy of the surroundings, has to equal negative delta H for the system over T for reversible reactions, right? We talked about that. We, we're calling this Q. Uh, right now, we're going to use delta H because it's going to be a more specific kind of Q. All right, so why don't we plug that in, plug this part into up here and see what happens to our equation. This is what we get. The change in entropy of the universe has to equal the change in entropy of the system minus the delta H of the system over T. Now notice we don't have to worry about the surroundings anymore. We have everything in terms of the system. All right, so let's get rid of that T by multiplying it uh, to both sides, and we end up with the temperature times change in entropy of the universe equals temperature times the change in entropy of the system minus the change in heat of the system, right? Uh, let's do a little rearranging. I just like putting delta H first, so I negate both sides, and I get negative T delta S of the universe has to equal delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. Cool. So we end up with this equation, which we're going to mess with a little bit more, okay? But we know if the change in the entropy of the universe is greater than zero, we got a spontaneous reaction. So if this is a positive value, well, T has to be a positive value, and we're throwing a negative in front of it, then I know that negative T delta S of the universe is a negative value for spontaneous reactions. So if delta H minus T delta S is negative, we have a spontaneous reaction. Negative T delta S of the universe is kind of a mouthful. And we're going to fix that in a second. Gibbs free energy. All right. So we're changing this whole thing to just delta G, which is going to be Gibbs free energy. Okay. So delta G, Gibbs free energy. It's the amount of work theoretically possible from a reaction. So if I did a reaction and it gave off energy, how much of that is possible to be used for work you know in a perfect system where you don't have uh energy loss because of friction or stuff how much work could be done from that reaction theoretically 
delta G is greater than zero, it's non-spontaneous. If delta G is less than zero, it is spontaneous. And if it's at zero, then it's at equilibrium, right? So this simplifies things because we don't have to look at what's happening to our surroundings. Everything is in terms of the system, which also means that we probably won't bother writing system every time. We'll just do delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, right? Because we all know now that we're talking about the system. All right, well, why is it called Gibbs Free Energy? That's kind of a weird name. Well, first off, J. Williard Gibbs proposed the concept. So you come up with a concept, you get to name it after yourself, uh, or you name it after anything. Do what you want. All right, and it's also called free energy because it's the maximum theoretical energy available to accomplish work. So think about this. The more negative the delta G is, the more energy is being freed up and can do work. So it's free energy. It's not free, like doesn't cost anything. It's the amount of energy that's being freed up. So if it's a positive value, that's the minimum amount of energy you'll need to make that process occur. All right, so if you had a non-spontaneous reaction, but you wanted it to happen, how much energy would you have to invest to get that to happen? All right, so delta G naught, you guys should hopefully see a pattern by now. That just means that it's at standard conditions, right? So like a lot of our delta whatever knots, you can look these up. I gave you guys tables. You can look them up. You don't have the tables. You can Google them. What is the delta G value for write your reaction? Or just Google uh, Gibbs free energy chart, standard chart. Uh, it's similar to what you've seen before, right? This delta G equals the sum of the products, gives free energy, minus the sum of the reactants, free energy. It's more of the same kind of math, but this time we're using delta G instead of delta H or delta S, okay? So example problem, calculate the change in gives free energy for the following reaction. I'm going to give you the decomposition of water into H2 and O2. Well, you look up the values on the chart. You go, hey, all right, well, I found H2O. And that's negative 237.13. So I know on this side, I'm going to have 2 because of this 2 times negative 237.13. And then the products end up being, well, let's see, H2 gas is 0. So I'm going to do 2 times 0. And whatever O2 is, 230.1. So I end up with 230.1 as my delta G for my products and I get I wrote this down because I don't want to mess up the math being put on the spot four seven four point two six negative as my delta G for or the sum of my G's for my reactants so now you just do the let's how did this change it went from negative four seventy four point two six to two thirty point one so I do all right products two thirty point one minus my reactants, negative 474.26. And I get, I wrote this number down to 704.36. Remember if I'm subtracting a negative, it's really like you're adding a positive. And I look for my units and it's kilojoules per mole. So I get that many kilojoules per mole. So if it's a positive value, notice that it is a positive value that this means that it is non-spontaneous, right? And if anybody knows the opposite of this reaction, H2 reacting with oxygen to make water, the hydrogen balloon demo that we've seen before, boom, you know that that is a spontaneous reaction. So the opposite of it is going to be a non-spontaneous reaction. If you want this to happen, if you want that reaction to happen, you got to invest that much energy to get it to happen, all right? Uh, so to summarize, this equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Know it. Love it. Make it your friend. If the delta G is greater than zero, it's non-spontaneous. If it's less than zero, it is spontaneous. And if it's at zero, you're at equilibrium. All right, and then know this. This is kind of a stupid equation. You shouldn't even have to remember. You just be like, hey, I know it's products minus the reactants. And those are values I'm going to have to look up and pay attention to the coefficient. Okay, so that's it. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, bring questions. I'll see you in class. Okay, bye.